We're going to continue this series about our kingdom mandate. And God really began to deal with me because there's several things in this. And let's get, get started. It says the kingdom of God is not a geographical place on earth, nor is it in heaven with its streets of gold and river of life. It is a governmental system where God's rule and authority are complete. Now, I know I read this to you every week, or at least every week that I do the, the series here. Sometimes God interrupts and we do something different, and that's okay. But when we begin to take a look at this, where we realize that it is a mindset, it is not some place to get to. We are still trying to, again, we're trying to do something, be something, go somewhere that we really are. We talk about, my wife and I talk about because we, I believe that, that we are on the edge of or on the verge of or however you want to say it, of such an awesome move of God. The problem is we keep saying if we'd do this or if we'd go there or if we'd, you know, we, we're looking for that next step. The problem is the move of God is here. God began to deal with me, and I'm already off and running. God began to deal with me that what we're doing on is waiting on something that is already here. The problem is we're not activating the move of God. We are still waiting on God to do something. We're still waiting on God to manifest Himself. We're still waiting on God to do this or to do that or to all of this other stuff. And it's not God that we're waiting on. It's us. You see, the kingdom of God Righteousness, peace, and joy. You know in Romans, righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God. It's not a geographical place. It is neither an event. And we're still waiting on an event. We're still waiting on a happening. We're still waiting on something. The problem with waiting on something is then what we say is we don't have it yet. And that doesn't coincide with what God's been telling me. The problem is we're still looking for something external and where it's going to start is internal. It's the gospel in its purest form. The kingdom of God is the gospel in its purest form. Free from traditions and religions of man. It is the gospel that applies to everyone and spans from the womb to the tomb. If you begin, if you remember the series, I know that we've been at this a while, but I begin with the gospel. The kingdom of God is the gospel in its purest form. It is Jesus Christ loves you enough to die for you already. It is the church visibly walking in the realities of Christ demonstrated in everyday life. Now, I preached a couple of sermons on the church, and the importance of the church, why it's important to attend, why it's important to be here, why it's important to be committed to your local house. But then the next, it is the righteous influence of God on the governments of this world, bringing real change to society, economic or to social, economic, and moral aspects of the world we live in. Last week we covered, it's important where you attend church, because it's important the message that you hear. If we come to a point where we, we spend our lives not having the move of God for our life because we're always looking for something else. God really began to deal with me that for too long we have looked for something else. We, we constantly are looking for the next thing. We're constantly... And what that says is we don't have it. Now, we either have it or we don't. You see, when we begin to realize what God is doing in our life, what we begin to realize is that the Father has already given us everything we need. Can I tell you the next move of God? It's right here, right here, already, in us, already. It's already there. See, we're waiting for that event. And, I, and me too, me too, all right? I, I'm, I'm waiting for that event. You know, I've spent the last two or three weeks desperately seeking the face of God. Because if it is a matter of belief, and God began to deal with me that it is a matter of belief, or at least in my thoughts it was a matter of belief, if the most powerful thing about us is our ability to believe then, can I tell you the most powerful thing about you also is your unbelief. Because where belief activates, unbelief negates. You see, if it really is hinging on belief, and so I said, all right, Father, it's belief. 
I've even, even ministered where sometimes I felt like the man that said, I believe, but help my unbelief. What is it about our lives that we continually go, I don't have it yet? Because of this mentality, this survivalist mentality, you know what that says? It says, what I have right now is not good enough then. Paul said, whether I'm, I, I have a lot or I have a little, I'm content. I don't see a lot of content Christians. We're always waiting for that next thing, that next blessing, that next move, that next whatever. Which means we're not comfortable where we're at. Now, please understand, I believe that God is a progressive God. Therefore, we must continue to move. But I also believe that if we're not careful, we get such a dissatisfaction about the God that we serve right now. I get dissatisfied with the relationship I have now if I'm constantly looking for something more. And oh, I want more. But God began to deal with me. God began to speak to me that we have stepped away from so many of the things where we just go, right now, God, you're good enough. Whatever I've got right now, I am content with what I have. I choose to say right now, God, where you're at is enough. Now, if tomorrow it's over there, then tomorrow over there is where I want to be. But here's the problem. And oh, let me tell you something. It's a mentality thing. I understand. Because you see, I have been preaching out of the boat. Out of the boat. I agree. But you see, what we have to do is we have to understand I'm not going to get out of the boat until i got a relationship here. Until I am confident in the relationship I have now, I'll never be confident enough to get out of the boat. You see, what we do is we feel like church is where we develop our relationship with God. Hmm. It doesn't work that way. Church is where we develop our relationship with each other, but it is not where you develop your relationship with God. So the kingdom of God is the righteous influence of God on the governments of this world, bringing real change to, to the social, economic, and moral aspects of the world we live in. Two years ago when I came, I said, or asked a question, is Live Oak County holy? And the answer I got was no. The church has become pessimistic at best. We do not feel anymore that we have the power to influence anything. And it's because we've been convinced that this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. You know, I found as through the years that when people rent, they don't take care of your stuff. Why? Because they don't own it. So, if they trash your house, I know, I've got renters. I have a house in Georgia. And as long as I tried to rent it, nobody took care of it. I'd go in and they'd be this busted and they'd be that messed up and they would be on and on. So, I got a bright idea. You know what that was? It's going to sell it. Owner finance. You know what I found? Now, I've had a couple of people in it. But they always left it better than when they bought it. Why? Because it was theirs. And they had responsibility over it. It was not somebody else's that they were borrowing, using, or renting. It was theirs. And they had ownership of it. Until the church changes its mind and says, Hey, I have ownership here. We're never going to change it. We talk about how unrighteous the world is, how dark the world is, how much... And, and listen, I don't know, media has convinced us of that. What do you see? Only bad. We don't see any good, hardly at all. You'll get 99% of it will be bad and they'll throw one good story in there just occasionally. Can I tell you that living in three rivers are some good people? 
Even some that aren't saved are good, moral people. The issue has become is that we've decided that heaven is my home, therefore I'm not responsible for what this world does. Matthew, the fifth chapter says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now the next verse. He sat there and said, Blessed, 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 blessed. Blessed, 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 blessed. Now he begins to define the church. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth. Now let's wait right there. Because see, a lot of preachers like to go on and now we're going to preach about sin and now we're going to preach about how unworthy and how unrighteous you are and if you've lost your saltiness, then bless God, you're just going to hell. Okay, I mean, maybe not quite that bad, but... But what it says to begin with is, you are the salt of the earth. So it defines you. The next verse, Shay. Ye are the light of the world. Now, now, let me ask you something. When he said that, he didn't say, you're the salt of heaven. You're the light of of that glorious city. No. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. The problem is, we don't believe that. We don't. You know, salt is a preservative. It, uh, they rub it on meat. It stops the decay. So why don't we change the world? Mostly because we don't think we're supposed to. We want people saved. Now please don't get me, don't get me wrong. But we only want to get them to save so they can go to heaven. We don't want so much them to get them saved. We don't have a problem believing that God came to save us. We just have a problem to believe that God is able to change the world. We have a problem believing that the God that I serve, this powerful, omnipotent, omnipresent, amazing God, isn't powerful enough to change Live Oak County. You know why? Because He's going to do it through you. That is the issue. My God, I'm not staying. Why I got to change things if I'm not staying? Why can't I just get people saved? Why can't I tell them about your life? We don't have a problem with salvation. It's all this other stuff that we have a problem with. You know why the kingdom is not preached? It's because the kingdom takes over. The kingdom is dominant. The kingdom says you will have dominion. Now, can I ask you something? When Jesus Christ, I mean when God created the heavens and the earth, He turned to man and He said, Have dominion. But He didn't say in heaven. What did he say? Over earth. You see, you're trying, to, you're trying to do something you wasn't called to do. I can just get to heaven. Let me tell you something. Heaven's not calling your name. He's not. I dislike those little, well, God called and they answered. No! Please. Got to where I was preaching every funeral around here. I didn't want to become known as a funeral preacher. I didn't like that. I was glad when the babies came along where we could be, you know, uh, where we could be dedicating them to God. And death, I've heard, is such a big part of life, you know. That's what I've heard. Heard that last night from my mother. Wait, time out. 
You see, somewhere in our life, we have to begin to understand that, yes, heaven will be where I go if I die. Didn't say when. Said if. Say, well, what? You just going to live forever? That's up to God. It really is. We were created to be immortal. Can I ask you something? How old was Adam? <laughs> Too old. How old was Adam before he fell? How old was he? We don't know. You see, somewhere we've, got, we've, we've bought it hook, line, and sinker that we can't do anything about where we're at. We can't change the place where we live. Why is crime prevalent? Why is there so much drug addiction? Why are these so many divorces? It's because we as the church have allowed the world to do what they wanted to do. Because we didn't think we could change things. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. Now let me ask you. Are you salt and light? Are you? Think about it. Because let me tell you something. We as a church, we, we don't have a problem meeting. We'll come together nice and secure in our own little place. And oh, we may be dissatisfied with a preacher or whatever, so we go somewhere else and blah, blah, blah. But you know what? We're nice and safe in here. I heard that there are people that like to come to this church because they're not sure what's going to happen every Sunday. <laughs> Me either. I'm okay with that. But what about this move of God happening out there? If we're the salt of the earth, we're the light of the world, What's the deal? Are we supposed to be influencers? If we are, then why don't we? So how does change come? How do we influence the world we live in? How do we bring change? Those are pretty tough questions, you'd think. I've asked those questions myself. Lord, how do we change Live Oak County? Lord, how do we change Three Rivers? How do we change my family? How do we change my, my economic uh, situation? How do, you know, on and on and on the questions go. So God began to deal with me because so often what we find is that we don't realize the power that we have. Now let me be very clear with you today. If you want to be an influencer, if you want to change the world around you, if you want, are you listening? I'm fixing to tell you how. Because God told me how. And it's very simple. Here it is. Pray. Period. I was waiting for a three-step program. I was waiting for a formula. Oh, I love math. Show me the formula. Show me what the parentheses and the pluses and all the signs and all that stuff. Let me work on that. Let me figure that out. Because you see, what we've done is we put God into this place where He's a formula to us instead of a relationship. You know what we've done? Oh, we all pray a little bit. Now, at least I hope we all pray a little bit. Um, but the power of the kingdom is prayer. The power that you have that you're supposed to display, the things that are supposed to change, the foundation of it is prayer. You see, it's not in here where you build a relationship with God. We worship God. We praise God. God moves in here. I've seen God touch people's lives in here. I've seen Him heal the hurting. All of those things in here. But that's not where the relationship comes from. The relationship is not developed in here. And if this is the only place you're developing your relationship with God, then you are missing it. You know where your relationship is built? In prayer. Why? Because that's communication. You have God's ear. He doesn't ever not listen to you. How powerful is that? Think about that for just a minute because we spend so much of our time saying, Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. When's the last time you really prayed? Now, prayer is communication. Therefore, it's a two-way street. You really want to be effective in your prayer life? Listen more than you pray. 
Do not fill your time full of words. You see, when we begin to develop a relationship with God at first, you ever watch couples, young, especially young couples, and they're just new relationship, and blah, 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 and they're talking, and they're always, you know, they're always communicating, they're always texting, they're always calling, they're always doing all that. I understand. I run up a $400 phone bill when Christine and I was uh, dating. We did a long, a long uh, I asked her to marry me, and the next week moved to Colorado. So uh, she said yes, and then I moved. So uh, I would run up a 400 Now, look, you've got to understand something. It's not like $400 today. This was a $400 bill 30-something years ago. My mother was not happy. Oh, and, and you know, we were just talking just stupid stuff. It wasn't, you know. And you know what now? I can sit on the couch next to her and I don't have to spend a lot of words but just being together. You see, I love these people that pray and oh, they pray and they pray and they pray and they amen and then they get up. Well, when did God get a chance to speak? When did God say something? When did God move in your life? You know why you don't hear from God? You don't stop long enough to listen. I spend lots of time in prayer. I do. I love behind the wheel. We go to Bernie three or four times a week. We go to San Antonio. It's not that big a deal. I love behind the wheel. And you know what? You think for that hour and whatever, I would be praying the whole time. You know what? Most of the time, I am sitting there thinking about God and listening for Him to speak to me. There is power in prayer. There is power in the words that you speak. There is power to change lives. There's powers to heal the sick. There's power there to do whatever needs to be done in this county to bring change. The problem is we don't pray. We complain. We complain a lot. But do we pray? Oh, see, what we're wanting to see is only going to come through prayer. It's going to come as we develop a relationship with God that says, God, speak, and I'll listen. I'm listening ever to hear your voice, ever to hear you speak, and even the silence is okay. When Paul instructed Timothy, the first thing he told him, Timothy 1, chapter 1, verse 1, all through that chapter, he's telling him all of these things. But chapter 2, verse 1 starts with this. I exhort thee therefore. What is that word therefore? It's because the whole last chapter he was telling him all of this stuff. And so he told him all of this stuff and he starts chapter 2 with going, because of all of that, that I just told you, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks to be made of all men. Pray. Pray because you change things. Pray because you can change things. Pray because you can make a difference. Pray, church, pray. Because in that prayer is what the world is waiting for. You know what they are? They're listening for the sound. What are they listening for? The sound of relationship that there's such a prayer war. Let me tell you something. You know when somebody touches God in their prayer? Oh, man, doesn't the atmosphere change? Because when they pray, we, we had a gentleman at our church that was there for a few months, and, and I'll be honest with you, I disagreed with a lot of the stuff that he, he, he said and the way he conducted his life. There were some things that I didn't agree with. Um, and, and, but you know what? When the man prayed, it changed the atmosphere. It changed the atmosphere. It changed the shifting of the atmosphere in that church when he prayed. I may not like the way he conducts his life, but when he prayed, it was like God went, okay, I'm listening. I'm listening. You know why? He told me one time. He said, he was a South African, so he had that accent. He said, I just believe God hears me all the time. And when he prayed, he prayed like heaven was paying attention 
And because of that, it shifted the atmosphere. How do you pray? Most of the time, it's with a big long prayer request list. God, I need you to do this. And God, and listen, it, they can be good things to be praying about. They needful things to be praying about. But so often, it's this list of things and when we're done, we're done. In fact, we prayed because I had a list. I needed God to do something. So I thought I'd pray. Why do you pray? Oh, I know. Shifting on you a little bit. You see, when we begin to realize that when we pray, God listens to every word. The problem is we're still not sure. That second verse there in Timothy says, Pray for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, life, quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. When's the last time you prayed for the mayor of Three Rivers? Chief of police. City manager. President of the United States. Congress. Senate. No, we're too busy. We've got other things to pray for. We've forgotten the power in prayer. Or maybe you've never really experienced. Prayer is a discipline. It is. It's communication with God. But it's where relationship is built. Can't have a relationship with God outside of prayer. Sorry. Doesn't happen. Relationship with God is not built in this church. Not here. Not during these services. It's built in the quiet place of prayer and meditation with the Father. Even Jesus, the Son of God, would separate Himself and pray. And if it's important enough for Him, don't you think it's important enough for us? You see, <clears throat> there was a man in my life. This man was named Jimmy Ellison. Jimmy Ellison was a friend of Dad's and had won him to the Lord. Jimmy Ellison had heart issues and all kinds of stuff. But my dad had won him to the Lord. And we became, our families became friends. In fact, the first girlfriend I ever had was his daughter. Uh, years and years and years and years and years ago. And you know, Jimmy did something that nobody else did. No, no man did in my life at that time. You've got to understand something. I was young. Jimmy never treated me. As a child. When I talked, he listened. And he listened as if we were an equal. He never listened as an elder to a child. You know, because I hate to tell you this, but have you paid attention to the way you listen to your kids? They're kids. So we tend to blow it off. Or halfway listen. But Jimmy Ellison never did that to me. He treated me and, and I wasn't, listen, I wasn't a man. I wasn't but 14 or 13 or however old it was. But that made such an influence in my life. You see, we don't realize that when we talk, God pays attention. We pray because it's what we're supposed to do. But some of us pray and never really think God hears. We're still waiting for that move or that emotion or that stirring or whatever. You know, I've heard people say, well, it doesn't seem like my prayers are getting above the ceiling. Let me tell you something. They don't have to get above the ceiling. Where's God? He's not up there. Oh, we still put Him way up there, but He's not. He's right here. And He doesn't turn a deaf ear. Can I tell you that the most powerful thing about you is your ability to believe? But the most powerful thing you can do is pray. The most powerful thing about you is your ability to believe. But the most powerful thing you can do is pray. 
The kingdom mandate. The reason this is important is because we're never going to change our world until we pray. When's the last time you prayed for the crime rate in Live Oak County? For the drug addiction? For the, and the list goes on and on and on. Ah, but see, this is not where I'm going to live. I'm going to live up there. I hate to tell you this, but even uh, whether you believe in dispensationalism or however your eschatology is, no matter what you believe, this is where it always ends up. Heaven comes down. You know why? I've told you before. You're created for this earth. In relationship with God. But can I tell you, you wasn't created for heaven. And until we start acting like we own this place, until we begin to believe that we're supposed to have dominion over this place, there will never be change in the economy, not true change. There will never be true change in the violence. There will never be true change in the divorce rate. There will never be true... Why? Because the world is corrupt. It is. We are the only light. James, the fifth chapter. 13th verse says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Now pay attention to this verse of Scripture. Pay close attention to what it really says. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the, name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, now we go, we'll heal the sick. That's not what it says. Prayer of faith will save the sick. How much power you really got? And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he, gave, if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Wow! How much prayer power do we really have? Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth. That word means to have or exercise force, literally or figuratively. Be able, avail. Can do. Be of strength. Be whole. Much work. The prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. See, here's the issue. And I'll be honest with you. We all have it. You know what that is? We're still not sure God hears us. Not always. Oh, now, buddy, you let, a, you let the anointing in here. and that, that, you, Oh, then God's listening. Then we've got God's attention. You know, we used to use terms like grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar. Just hung on until God... Well, let me tell you something. They pulled that from the Old Testament and it was never a good thing. When they grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar, you know what happened? They died. Every time in the Old Testament when they grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar. Think about it when you say something. You see, when we begin to realize how much power we really have, when we pray, things change. See, we're still not sure though when we get out there. Still not sure. You see, if you really believe that the words you spoke changed lives, oh, then we'd be praying all the time. Oh, you would. Trust me. You'd look at a situation and because you knew you had what it took to change that situation, you'd begin to declare and you'd begin to pray and you'd begin to speak. But we're still not sure. So let me ask you something. There's three or four major truths that we have slacked up on in the church. Part of it, first one in my opinion, is prayer. 
Because we're never going to fulfill our kingdom mandate until we understand what kind of authority we really have. Can I ask you, how much authority do you have? When it comes to that world out there, when it comes to demons, when it comes to... How much power do you have? When it comes to changing people's lives, how much power do you have? Well, it's like this, brother. Oh, I've heard it all. And we'll continue to hear it all. Sometimes I hear it from the mirror when I'm looking. But I have determined in 2017 one of my favorite books is um, that series that Frank Peretti wrote uh, this uh, it's Present Darkness and Piercing the Darkness and there's, oh, those books are great in my opinion. And in the books, in the first one, a little preacher was pastoring a church. And in the books, it tells the story of what, what man is doing and what the angels are doing and what the demons are doing. Okay, it's, it's, it's fictional, though I think it's pretty close. But somebody had defaced the property and they were at the church property and the pastor and his wife were out there cleaning things up and, you know, God began to move on him and he began to pray. And... Here's what the demons called him. We have to watch that praying man. That, not the preacher. Not a pastor. Got to watch that praying man. Because he shook heaven. He brought change. I want to be known as the praying man. I want to be the one that, know, that, that communicates with God. That so believes and understands that when I speak, God listens. I understand that this is a progressive thing. I understand that we have to line up on line, precept upon precept. But you know what? Line up on line, precept on precept is not going to change. Until we pray. You know, I, we, we do prayer first Thursday of every month right here. And you know what? We, have, we don't have that many people show up. Mostly because it's just prayer night. It's because we don't understand. Not only is my individual prayer life important, but us corporately, when we pray, changes things. When we come together on that night to focus on prayer, we change things. But see, we have an attitude of, well, it's just prayer night. One of the greatest moves of God that ever happened in Cedartown happened after we started taking our Sunday night services and all we did was pray. We did that for, for a few months. And you know what? God stepped in that place. What could we do? If we really believed we could hear God, our God would hear us when we pray. What, do you, what could you change? How would you change things? The broken hearted, the crippled, the family that's busted apart, the, and the list goes on and on. Oh, but didn't the word say that prayer of faith will save? the sick, and God will raise them up. You see, we don't hurt for each other anymore. Um, Lisa texted me today. said, please pray. You see, what you need to understand is when you text me or when you call me and say, please pray, I stop right then and I pray. Right then. When people ask me, well, pray for me on the street, guess what? I pray for me. Guess what? I'm liable to pray for them right then and right there. So unless you want me to pray for you out there in public, don't ask because I'm going to pray. She texted me and said, please pray. My mother-in-law has been unresponsive for five days. And unless God moves, you know, it's so hard. We did the same thing. Watch Christine's mom pass that way. For two weeks she laid in, 
in a bed and didn't know anybody and you know do we believe that God hears us when we pray the word of God says that angels are ministering spirits do you realize the reason there is no time or space in God do you realize that when they call me or Tammy texts me and says India is falling apart that when I pray God moves in India right then Whatever I believe is done in India. But it's also done down the street at your house. Or <laughs> how much power do you really have? You see, somewhere along the way, you know, there used to be an old statement. I prayed till I got I prayed till I prayed till I got through. Most of us just pray until we through. Because we've got a busy life. Listen. You want power? Pray. You want to change things? Pray. Not some little mealy mouth, weak need. Oh God, oh God, please, oh please. When we realize what authority we have, we've been given power and authority. You know, there are areas, everybody has strengths. You know what? Demons don't give me a bit of, bit of problem. Just charge hell with a water pistol. I don't care. You know, because I've seen God move too many times. I know that everything they've got, no matter how powerful it is, is nothing compared to what I've got. So if I can believe that there, why can't I believe that elsewhere? Well, I'm working on it. See, I'm the same place you are. God put us here together for a reason. So that we can change things. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. And Lord, I speak now that you will give us revelation of the power of prayer. And that Lord, you will begin to stir within us that desire to pray, to communicate, to speak your word. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.